All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Slay at Home speaker series. We're really stoked to have you all here tonight. Um, we are presenting tonight with, in partnership with Kapow um, Guides. They're based up in Revelstoke. We've got um, one of their guides on board, um, Adam Zock. I'll give you a little intro later. And we're going to be talking about um, what gear you should be using in the backcountry with our expert guide, uh, panelist of guides. So first, um, who am I? I'm Alex Showerman. I am Weston's PR manager. I've been with the brand over four years. Uh, I started out as an ambassador back in 2016. Prior to that, I was a um, writer for Transworld and Backcountry Mag, tested a bunch of gear over the years before I landed with Weston. Um, stoked to be hosting tonight. Uh, then we've got um, Alex Blanchard. Um, and Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you all for attending tonight. Um, I've worked for Weston for four, about four years now. Currently, I run production and sustainability for us, and have, I've become the resident skier as we've expanded out, and I've got to help shape and design our skis and working, working on that program now. So super stoked to talk about some skis tonight. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And then, yeah, from Kapow, who's our uh, co-sponsor tonight, we've got Adam Zock. Uh, Adam, take it away. Hey, uh, yeah, guys, I'm Adam. Um, I live out in Revelstoke, as Alex mentioned. Uh, I'm an ACMG ski guide out here. So for all you Americans, that's basically the Canadian version of the AMGA. Uh, Kapow is one of the main companies I work for. I probably work for them more than anybody. So a lot of that split boarding and ski touring trips, either at Rogers Pass, heli drops around here. We've got a lodge called the Blanket Glacier Chalet we fly to and uh, ski at for days at a time. But I also do some work for a company called Selkirk Tangiers Heli Skiing, uh, Revelstoke Backcountry Guides, and I take my own bookings for private ski tours or some other lodges in the area too. So um, yeah, you'll hear from me lots later in the night. I won't overdo it now. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for being here, Adam. We're really stoked to have you. Of course. Then we've got Josh Jesperson. Um, he is one of our uh, one of our athletes on the team, and also uh, a guide uh, here in Colorado. Josh, take it away. Hey, what's going on, guys? Josh Jesperson. Looks like people are tuning in from all over the world, and somebody from Philly, PA. I'm originally from PA. Grew up skiing in the Poconos, but um, yeah, I'm a professional snowboarder and mountain guide based in Colorado. Um, work for Silverton Avalanche School, do Navi education and ski guiding. And um, also the record holder for climbing and skiing all 54 of Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks. So um, don't ever let skiers tell you that split borders are slower. <laughs> Didn't you take it by like quite a big margin too? Wasn't it like a pretty significant number of days? Yeah, the, the original record, or the, well, the record was uh, Chris Davenport, and he had it for 361 days, and then I did it in 138 days. Ooh, nice work. Thanks for being here, Josh. We're stoked yeah. to have you. <laughs> totally. Um, and then also we've got um, Izzy uh, Lazarus, who's an amazing guide up out of Jackson and also on the Weston team. We're super stoked to have her here. Uh, Izzy, take it away. Hey, everybody. I am Izzy, as Alex said, and currently on the East Coast visiting family, but spend my time in Jackson, Wyoming. I mostly work out of there, climbing, backcountry snowboarding, uh, all the sorts. I also teach a lot of avalanche courses, do some work out in the Cascades, but just generally try to be outside and love teaching. So here virtually teaching for, I think, my first time. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Izzy. Super stoked to have you. Totally. Cool. All right. So tonight's going to be a pretty uh, jam packed night. We're going to cover all of the pieces or not almost all of the pieces uh, that you need uh, for uh, going into the backcountry on your split board or uh, skis. Um, so we'll start with sort of choosing your first setup, go over some things to look for, head on through bindings, boots, skins, poles, avi gear, first aid, and then additional stuff that you might need. 
Um, one note is feel free to chime in to the Q&A um, in the chat window. Um, we'll have our panelists as well as some Weston folks uh, answering questions in there. And then at the end, we'll also have a 10 minute Q&A and we'll be pulling some of the best questions um, that, that are or most commonly asked questions out from the Q&A section for more of a broader group discussion. Um, so that's kind of how the night's gonna run. Um, and then, yeah, on to choosing your first split. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through this real quick. Um, first is kind of understanding um, what the right shape is for you. What's your riding style? Um, here we have our power, you know, more powder specific boards, our Japao, our Backwoods, our Eclipse. Um, typically, these are defined by, you know, longer, wider nose. Um, and a shorter uh, tail with a setback stance. Um, so it's gonna be something that has a lot of great float and powder. Um, our backwoods and eclipse are also really great kind of trend into kind of what I like to call ATV boards um, with that camber and their flex are they're really good even when the conditions get kind of cruddy. Um, then we have directional, um, direct, basically what are directional twins. So, um, you know, the board's more, um, you know, more kind of that traditional snowboard shape, not that really big creative, um, very directional shape, um, but it, it features a, a setback stance generally. So it's, it has, still has the float in powder that you're gonna see with the, the more powder specific, but it's a little bit more of a versatile all mountain, um, <clears throat> all mountain board. Um, here we have our Riva, which is our women's uh, big mountain board, our Seeker, which is our women's intro split, and then our switchback, which, um, which is our men's intro split. <clears throat> Uh, then you get into the twin freestyle. This is really going to be for the rider that is, you know, wanting to go hit jumps in the backcountry, you know, butter, drop pillow lines, all that stuff. Um, you know, it's going to be a little bit more centered. Some have a little bit of setback, but it's more focused on being able to ride twin um, and really be able to play, um, kind of make the mountain your playground. Um, so the boards that we have is the range and then the rise, um, which are men's and women's respective um, twin focus split boards. And then one of the things you're seeing on the market a lot now is um, these hybrid shapes. So this is our hatchet. Um, so it's volume shifted. So this is going to be a shorter, fatter board. Um, we've done a really cool uh, design with this where it actually feels and rides on hard pack, sort of more like a twin. Um, but then uh, it has that more kind of directional design so that you can have that fun float in the deep powder. Um, it's designed to be ridden shorter. So at a 152, um, if like you're six foot tall, or something you could ride this short board so it's gonna be a really playful fun board you're starting to see more of these kind of hybrid designs on the market um, and and can be a good option um, depending upon your riding style uh, then picking your board um, you know a lot of people will recommend sort of to size up um, i think also for a first board it can be good to make sure that it is still close and similar to the board size that you tend to ride um, so that's just sort of the thing to kind of keep in mind. The reason people recommend sizing up is you're carrying more gear, you might be going to bigger lines, um, but don't go too big or you might feel a little frustrated with the size. And then this is probably one of the most important things. Um, I'm gonna kick it to our guides about why you should have this specific camber profile um, for touring. So um, Adam, do you want to kind of chat and any and, and Josh and Izzy chime in, but why is a camber, why is the profile so important when choosing your split? Yeah, I could take a stab at that. So when it comes to a solid snowboard, based on personal preference, you could have kind of a variety of shapes. Some people like rocker or kind of wiggly shapes that incorporate a variety of camber and rocker, even throughout the center of the board. And at the resort, that tends to work just fine. But for a split board, if you're gonna be spending most of your day touring, you really have to think about how the thing skins as well. So having a cambered board, when you weight that in the center with your foot, it pushes it down fairly flat and you get a lot of contact area with the snow, whether it's with your skin or with the metal edge on the side as you're trying to traverse a slope. Um, with a more rockered shape, you really don't get nearly as much contact with whatever it is that's holding you up and keeping you from sliding back down the mountain. So you're going to find yourself working a lot harder to skin if you have any shape other than a cambered shape. Uh, for the downhill, camber is pretty sweet also. Um, it is kind of personal preference, but it allows you to have a lot of pop. 
um, and kind of a snappy feel to your board, which a lot of riders seem to like. Um, and the, the key is that this camber is most important in the center of the board. So having some rocker, or, you know, every board will have a bit of a turned up nose and tail for the most part, but a little bit extra, especially in the nose, doesn't do you any harm. It doesn't take away from these characteristics I'm talking about. Um, especially having some in the nose just keeps it up above the surface of the snow, makes it handle deep powder better, and it might be a little bit easier to initiate your turns too. Um, so for me, I, I would really steer any way, everybody away from getting a snowboard that is not cambered unless they have a really specific reason to do so and it's part of a quiver of boards. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, and also Adam mentioned, uh, Adam mentioned the importance of camber on the way down as well. Um, and a point to that is like you encounter so many different kinds of snow in the backcountry. Uh, you could be riding powder to windborne to nev, and you just need to be able to have that camber, like he's saying, to hold edge on all of it when it comes up in front of you out of nowhere. Totally. Sweet. Izzy, anything to add? I'm good for now. Sweet. All right, cool. Then one of the other things that's really important is not to split your own. Um, you know, back in the days, this was how we as snowboarders were able to access the backcountry. So these DIY kits were really important as far as pioneering split boarding. Um, but now there's so many wonderful options on the market um, that there's really not a reason to split your own. Um, there's a lot of downsides to it. Um, you got to put all that hardware that's pictured into your board or onto your board. So you add a lot of weight. Um, you, when you cut down the middle of the board, you, uh, you know, basically strip out or cut through a lot of the structural, um, integrity of the board. So like, you'll hear a lot of people say their DIY boards ride like wet noodles. Um, and then the other thing too, is, is you don't have that all important inside edge, um, which is a really important edge for touring. Um, so we really recommend, um, and this isn't, you know, just as being the fact that we're, you know, a split board, a company that manufactures split boards, we really try and steer people towards buying, um, I mean, you know, actually purpose built split boards versus cutting an older board. Um, anything to add to sort of, have, have any of you had any bad experiences with a DIY or have you, or anything like that, that you want to add that, or war, tales of caution? Yeah. I broke my collarbone on a DIY board. Like when I first started split boarding, it was the old style. It was like an inch off the board already. And a friend of a friend had taken a park board and cut it in half. So she took a already super noodly board and made it even noodlier. And uh, I just found myself in some icy conditions and the board just had no rigidity to it. And I just clothed myself and led to my first collarbone fracture. Uh, so I'm up against <laughs> Yeah, I'll chime in too. I know sometimes this seems appealing because it, people think it's going to be less expensive. Like, I understand split boards are expensive. I started working for Weston as an intern because I couldn't afford a split board. I was like, hey, can I work for a board? But like, if you're in that case, check out Craigslist, check out Facebook. There's a really strong and growing used market for stuff. So don't let, there's ways to find a reasonably priced board, but a reasonably priced factory split board. One of the like closing things I always like to say too is, is with split boarding, you spend so long skinning to get to the top of your line that it's like, you really wanna make that one or two descents that you get that day count. So like having a board that you love is like worth every cent because otherwise you're like, oh my God, I'm putting in all this effort and then I don't really like how it rides. So it's like kind of a bummer when you have a DIY that just doesn't even really ride all that well and you've put in all that effort to get to the top of the line. Cool. Moving on. So yeah. So why, you know, why hat? Why is it important to have a factory um, split? Well, first and foremost, um, you know, nowadays almost every single split board is designed. You know, it's they're des they are designed as two pieces to ride in that are put together and ride as one. Um, so there's a lot of thought into you know, for example, a lot of our splits and solids have different. Um, you know, different internals. So that way, when you ride the split, it feels like the solid rides, um, taking into account that it is inbuilt and you are riding a board that is two pieces. Um, so that's a really important part is that, you know, the, these boards are engineered as split boards. Um, 
then you have in you have proper sidewalls and edges, which is really important for touring. Um, you know, you can have things like holeless bases. There's less hardware. Um, you know, all sorts of you know. With Weston, one of the things that we do is we make sure that we tail weight all of our split boards, so that way you're not having your nose dive when you're trying to kick turn. Um, your tail stays low, so it makes kick turns and everything easier. So you're just going to have all in all a better day on a factory split. Um, anything to add guides? I think we covered it. Moving on. Cool. Connection systems. So this is probably one of the most important parts of the modern day split board. And now there are so many options. Um, so Izzy, I think you are ready to kind of walk us through like what to look for when you're looking at these connection systems and, and trying to make a decision about, you know, buying a board that has one or, or maybe swapping out one to, to try and get a little more performance. What, what should we all be looking for? Absolutely. Um, so a split board connects both at the tip and tail, which is the image on the left side of the screen. Uh, it says locked open. And then at two points uh, at the middle of the board. And uh, both of those systems can be divided into passive systems versus active systems. So something with a locking or you know, like cinching mechanism. Uh, pros for a passive system is that it's just simple. There's less moving parts, things to break, uh, but you're not getting any extra pull for your board together. So if you've written a split in the past, you might see some flex in the two boards. So the more active connection systems tend to eliminate that wiggle, which, you know, especially as you start to get into firmer snow conditions, you notice the play in the boards more. You know, five years ago, it was dramatic how much wiggle there was in boards. It's getting better and better so that there's less and less. But for me, what I think about most is how do my bindings attach to the board? So if you're on a traditional puck system, and we'll get into bindings uh, a little bit later, traditional puck system, the bindings is sliding on and off the board. So you're not getting any extra ratchet from your bindings. So if I have a system like Sparks, I'm going to want to put a connection system on the board and on the tip and tail that's active, something like the Karakoram clips, because I want to pull that board together. Binding systems like Karakoram bindings and Phantom, which is a hard boot binding, those bindings ratchet onto the boards themselves, so they're pulling the board. So there you have a little bit more wiggle room, and you can say, well, I'm partial to active connection systems anyway, I'll put that on my board, or you can get away with a more passive system. Um, that's my two cents on those parts. Uh, maybe I'll pass it off to somebody else for talking about blue mount versus top mount. I'm not as familiar. Anybody else have anything to add? I would just generally agree with Izzy. Um, I think how your bindings attach is a key factor deciding if you need an active clip on the board or not. Um, it's great that the ones the Western boards come with are versatile enough to work for everybody, um, including with Sparks, which are some of the most common soft boot bindings out there. Um, I too use Phantoms, which draw the board together so I can get away with the passive clip and I like its simplicity. Um, but the Karakoram clips that come on Western boards can also be set up loose enough where they behave as such. So it can kind of go either way. It could be simple or it can draw the board together super tight. You get to pick based on the rest of your setup. Yeah, and how Adam said they're adjustable um, to whatever tolerance you want them at. They also over time will change from the tolerance that maybe you want them at. So remember that sometimes maybe a month or two or halfway through the season, you're gonna to wanna to tighten those clips no matter what to make sure your board is as together as you'd like it to be. It's an awesome note, Josh. All right, thanks everybody. On to the next one. So yeah, now we're gonna kick it over to Alex um, to talk about skis. Take it yeah, away. So less moving parts, but doesn't necessarily make it any easier to choose. And there's still a lot of options out there. The nice part is at the end of the day, any ski can be a touring ski. It's not like split boards where they have all the inserts and hardware built in. Like you can put a touring binding on any ski. That being said, there's definitely things to look for when trying to pick out a backcountry setup. Um, first thing and probably the most obvious number is the length of the ski. Um, generally speaking, 
you're probably wanting to stay in the same length range as what you're used to at the resort. Maybe you can size up a little bit, but if you're skiing a 180 centimeter ski, you're probably looking to stay about the same. That being said, you have more variation in the width of the ski. So that's how wide it is at the narrowest point in the middle. That's the most, you'll usually see three numbers on a ski. That's the width at the tip, width at the middle, width at the tail. The width in the middle is gonna be the driving, driving factor for those. So that's what somewhere where you can be looking to size up a little bit width wise. A um, couple of general notes before we dive into some more specifics. Obviously, not maybe not obviously, but ideally you're looking to save weight if you can. Um, the less weight, the less the weight, the, or the less the ski weighs, the less you have to haul up the hill. That being said though, you can go too light and you'll get to a point where the ski just isn't fun to ski anymore. So you're trying to find that balance. Um, and then kind of the same with the flex. Um, softer skis are going to be easier to ski. They're more forgiving. Where stiffer skis, more stable at speed, more responsive. Flex is more of a personal preference, and this will kind of carry over from the resort. You don't necessarily have to have a stiff ski in the backcountry. Um, just you'll figure this out based on what you're used to and what you usually ski. So then jumping into kind of the two main categories I see in the backcountry. Um, kind of that quiver one ski, this has become super popular recently. Width wise, somewhere in that 95 to 110 millimeter range. They're going to vary a little bit by region and what you're used to skiing. But this is a great ski just in its versatility. This can do anything from steep technical terrain to float well in powder. Um, just kind of to Josh's point earlier, like you never know what you're going to see in the backcountry. So you want to be prepared for everything. Uh, usually I like to have a slightly stiffer ski in this category. So kind of that mid stiff to stiffer flex. Um, flex is usually rate, uh, rated on like a one to 10, a little bit of variation company to company, but somewhere in that like five to eight range. And then as far as camber and rocker profile goes, a lot of that carries over from snowboards too. Um, but I'm looking for kind of a medium to long camber zone. So that's how much of the ski under your foot is cambered. Uh, but it still wants some of that rocker in the tip and tail for float. So for us, we have our summit ski. Um, I've been super stoked. This is my go-to ski just day in, day out. I know I'm ready for anything on this. Um, yeah. And then the other side of things, well, another side of things, I guess, is jumping into that more powder specific ski. So this is 105 millimeters and up. They go, my roommate has a 148 ski underfoot. Um, they can get really big, but kind of that 105 to 120, 125 seems to be the sweet spot for powder skis. Um, these still looking for a lightweight ski, but they're probably gonna be a little bit heavier. So don't let don't let a slightly heavier ski scare you off from a, a ski that's going to be a lot of fun. A um, little bit different from the all mountain side of things. Powder skis are probably going to be more rockered, more rocker in that tip and tail. But I still really like having some camber underfoot for the same reasons they were explaining in the split board. Like you need to have some traction where if you're at the resort, you can probably get away with a full rockered ski because you're not trying to skin. Um, and then another thing you can kind of see on the tails of our skis, we have a little notch there. I found with bigger skis, skins can become harder to keep on. Isn't necessarily a deal breaker, but something to keep an eye out for. Um, so this is our Grizzly, which is new for this year. Here you've got, you can't really see it from this picture, but yeah, it's that shorter camera zone, big rocker tip and tail. Um, going to keep you up above the snow once it gets in that like six to eight plus inches of fresh snow. So, cool. And then right. I think next we're talking about camber. Yeah. So kind of hit this already looking all skis to some, ex well, not all, but most backcountry touring skis are going to be some variation of rocker and camber. Okay. But like I was saying, looking for a little bit longer camber zone on your more all mountain daily driver ski. 
And if you're trying to add that powder ski to the quiver, we're looking for more of that rocker tip and tail for float. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. All right. So now moving on to choosing your bindings. So one of the things that's really rad about where we are right now is there are so many awesome options out there for us uh, compared to, you know, the early days of split boarding where uh, you were basically screwing on your resort bindings to a plate. Um, so uh, I'll kind of kick it off as I'm, I'm most familiar with Spark and then open it up to the guide. So Spark is what I've been using for pretty much the entirety of my split boarding career. Um, what I really like about them is they're simple, bomb proof, easy to repair, um, easy to use, um, you know, an affordable price point, you know, they're kind of about the same cost as, you know, a, a high end resort binding. Um, so they're just, I like to call them like the Toyota Tacoma of split board bindings. They're just simple and bomber. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my thoughts on Spark. Um, and then, yeah, I know when it comes to soft boot bindings, really the other, you know, category leader as well as uh, Karakorum. Um, and uh, Josh, you're a, you're a Karakorum athlete as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, why you like, uh, why you like Karakorum and, and sort of what rider Karakorum is going to, going to work for? Yeah, absolutely. Would you put the Karakorum slide up real quick? Oh, yeah. Right there. Yeah. So I think Karakorum, you know, um, I would say four years ago, you know, the analogy of uh, Sparks being Toyotas and Karakorums being the Ferraris may have been more true, but over the years, like they've definitely simplified their design and made things a lot more intuitive and user friendly. So I think that's kind of dispelled. Um, because they've come a long way and I would just like, you know, try to throw that out there for them. Um, you know, I ride the prime X, uh, carbon. It has the stiffest high back. I love it. The board control and feel from the thing is amazing, but some of the features are the, the prime interface, which is the same puck system, but not pucks. It, it actively joins the board together. You put the binding on flip a lever up and it brings it together. Um, which really helps. And then the Alpine and the Connect Series, the Connect Series is really cool because you can get one binding and quiver a split board and solid boards with the quiver connectors. So that's another really cool feature. Um, the dual speed riser is great. Um, solid binding feel and all hardware is connected women's and men's models. I think another great thing about them is they have a crash replacement policy. So they want you to maintain your bindings as long as you can. And whenever anything breaks on them, just send them to Karakorum. They'll fix that piece and then send it back to you. So you don't have to buy a whole nother set of bindings. Awesome. Sweet. Um, Izzy, Adam, on soft boot bindings, I know you both predominantly hard boot, but do either of you have anything to add sort of on Spark, Karakorum, any other, anything additional thoughts? Uh, not much. I would just go ahead and say that Spark and Karakorum are kind of the two may, the two most popular options people go with. That's where I would begin your search. Um, Karakorums do join more actively, like Josh was saying, and uh, Sparks are a bit simpler, but they're substantially cheaper too. So it kind of depends what you're looking for. Sweet. Awesome. All right. Uh, so then we've got um, hard boot bindings. Um, so I know both of you ride for Phantom. So do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, why you hard boot and sort of the, the rider that a hard boot binding is going to speak to and, and also tell us a little about Phantom? Sure. So yeah, I ride exclusively hard boots. I really don't do much resort riding. Um, but even when I do, I bring my hard boots. It's kind of all I have these days. And I've been on them for five or six years now. Um, I like them for my style. I like a lot of really long tours. I like pretty aggressive ski mountaineering. I do a lot of climbing while I'm riding. Um, I do a lot of split skiing. I, as a guide, I have to guide skiers a lot and I don't want them waiting on me. So I often split my board through flat or low angle or undulating terrain and use my setup as a pair of skis. Um, I think this setup's great for all of those kinds of things. I do not think it's the first thing to go out and buy if you've never been split boarding before. Um, really, it makes sense to use, you know, whatever boots you already own for the resort, 
get some soft boot bindings. They're going to be a lot cheaper. Go, go ahead and get yourself a split board and the rest of the gear we're going to talk about and you're off to the races. Um, this gear, while it's come a long way and being able to be used easily out of the box, um, you do have to think a little bit more about how to, how to tweak it a little bit here and there to match your style. So I would say this is for a, a touring focused rider who um, likes to put in long days um, and might find themselves climbing over rock or firm snow, that type of thing. Um, yeah, I, I think I started riding the hard boots for a similar reason to Adam of being on longer tours, guiding, split skiing. Uh, but the more that I use it, the more I just like, oh, this is really, it works for me. It, it makes the touring uphill a lot lighter because you're not carrying the whole binding on your foot. So with a spark or caracorum system, you know, this is your board, your binding, your foot comes up and you're pulling the whole binding up on a spark or caracorum binding. And so if that's 900 grams on your foot and you do that 10,000 times in a day, it adds up. So having a lighter ski while I was skinning, I just feel like overall throughout the day, I have more energy. Um, I'd rather carry something in my backpack than on my feet. And then the other thing is I have really cold feet and I personally find that I have a lot more, uh, I can adjust my boots for me with the ski boots. Um, I can put an intuition liner that's a lot warmer. I can mold the boots to my feet, which makes sure that they're not getting pinched in any weird way. Um, so I've had a lot of troubles with circulation and having the hard boots has helped me for that way, for that. Um, I also like the consistency of just having buckles on the boots instead of ratcheting laces and my hands are cold or tired. I just know that every time I buckle my bottom buckle to the third clip and the top buckle to the fourth clip that my boot's gonna ride how it's ridden every single time, which as you step into more advanced terrain, you want that assurance that your boot and your board are gonna feel like they always have. Um, so it's great if you are trying to get into split board mountaineering or scheme mountaineering, I guess. Um, but they also are super fun in powder. And uh, I think they make my touring experience pretty awesome. I'll ride soft boots every now and then, but, uh, and I ride them at the resort for, cause I have to for work, but uh, I really like the hard boot system for, for where I live and what I do. Yeah. And I think it's important to realize that hard boots have changed a lot in the last several years, uh, mm -hmm. largely with the advent of Phantom and their bindings. So a lot of the setups you've seen, you know, in decades past, are carving setups for on piece at the ski resort, racing, that type of thing. Uh, these couldn't be further from that. So these still allow a lot of mobility leaning towards the tail or the nose of your board. Uh, these bindings actually allow the boot to shift in it a little bit um, to give it a softer feel, even if the upper of the boot, depending on your boot choice, might actually be fairly stiff. So it gives it a more natural feel for snowboarding. And as we'll talk about in the boot section too, um, now you can kind of move and lean forward, put weight on your toes, hinge at the ankle. So, you know, I, my style of riding um, is not just ski mountaineering and getting down. I love hucking myself off of cliffs, smashing pillow lines. I am a fairly aggressive rider and hard boots totally work for me for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really important to realize that this is not the hard boot setup you've seen someone carving with at the ski hill probably. Yeah. I also think they're pretty sweet um, in the sense that transitions are a little bit faster. So getting this thing on and off of your boot is really quick just because of that bail style binding. Um, you kind of just stuff the heel in place, whip the toe lever up, it's faster than straps. When you're putting it on the board, it tends to clear snow out of its way quite well on its own. It rotates into place and I usually just overshoot the rotation. It kind of blasts all the snow out of there and then return to where I want it and put it in. And then in the picture on the left there, you can kind of see some little silver tabs sticking out and they're attached to pins that go into the center. So you just flip those up to free the binding up to put it on your board. You push those pins down and that's an active joining system like we've been talking about earlier. Um, so I like how that draws the board in close to each side. Um, that's the most important spot to draw the board together is right by your feet. And it allows me to use a passive clip, which I find is just faster and more convenient. I kind of pride myself on fast transitions, especially when I'm guiding skiers. I try to be really on top of my game and uh, you know, get everything done before they can. So um, I think it's pretty good for that as well. Um, 
yeah, I think I covered most of the stuff that I really love about those bindings. We'll talk a lot more about hard boots in general in the boot section. Um, but the key thing with Phantom, I think, that really separates it from its competition is its ability to allow the boot to move a little bit as you lean towards your tail or the nose of your board. That kind of rocking action gives it a natural soft boot type feel. Um, and that's why Phantoms are the only hard boot bindings I've ever actually used. I think they're by far uh, the best option out there. Aren't they also designed by a rocket scientist? Yes, John is a, a legit rocket scientist. He knows what he's doing. He's a hell of an engineer. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, on that note, um, also Spark does do offer a hard boot option. Um, Izzy, I know that this is sort of what you started with. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about like who this might be good for? Yeah, totally. So definitely a better option price-wise. Sparks are, uh, the bindings are a bit cheaper. Um, Weight-wise, they're similar and maybe even like 10 grams lighter than the Phantom system if you're super into weighing things. But um, no, they're pretty simple binding. They'll work on your current Spark Puck system. So they use that same Tesla system. It just acts as a clamp. You slide the binding on, clamp it down, and it's on. Um, so if you're somebody who's like, well, I want to do all this riding in the winter in POW and I want to ride my soft boots. I don't want to ride my hard boots, but in the spring, I want to ride hard boots. Well, then you can just keep your pucks on your board, same as, slide the bindings on and then swap out the to touring bracket and the risers. And that'd be the only adjustment you have to make. So if you have spark system or if you ride on pucks already and you're not fully committed to riding hard boots every day that you're in the backcountry, this is a pretty cool option. Um, my qualms with it are um, the bindings themselves, they have this kind of death grip on your binding. So as Adam was talking about the phantom boots, they allow for a little bit of rock so you can move fore and aft on your board. Um, these don't have that. You're pretty locked into the binding. And then the other thing is uh, you need to then have canted pucks. So your pucks lay on your board flat normally, or you can buy pucks that have slight cant. So they bring your knees in, um, which is just a game changer as far as comfort for riding in the hard boot. So the phantom bindings, the bindings themselves have a right and a left that they have cant built in. But if you're gonna ride the spark hard boot bindings, it's really advantageous to have those canted pucks. And you can ride canted pucks on your soft boots as well. It's pretty comfortable. Um, so it's something to think about if you were going to go ahead and purchase the Spark Dinos is to just think about getting candid pucks and that'll make it a better experience. But they're a good binding. You know, my preference is the Phantom just because I think the engineering is really solid and they work for me. Uh, but if you like supporting Spark, then this is a great option. I was yeah, going to say the one thing that I would be like, or I would be stoked to add too, is that I've had a couple pairs of Phantoms and I still have my original pair of Phantoms and they still work great. So, you know, I ride almost 150 days a year, I would say. And these things have been super durable. Um, they're mostly metal. So they do stand up to the test of time. On a soft boot binding, you will find more flexible parts, plastic parts, things that just wear out and replace your ratchet straps, whatever. I really haven't noticed much of that going on with my bindings. Um, yeah, they're still surviving. And I would imagine that's true for the spark ones as well, just given what they're made out of. And I was just going to say for the soft booters, Izzy's bringing up, uh, the canted pucks. I've been riding canted pucks on my soft boots sparks for years now. And there is a definite noticeable difference in comfort. Highly recommend that change. Um, if, uh, or, or if you're looking at your first pucks, the canted pucks are definitely, I find to be a really nice option for folks who are riding sparks. All right. Um, so for the skiers on the call, uh, we got a little bit of info about all the options of, um, uh, ski tech, ski binding tech. So, uh, Alex, once again, if you want to take it away here. Yeah, so there's a lot more manufacturers on the ski side. It's just, it's been around for longer. There's more players in the game. But that being said, there's like three main styles of touring bindings. The first you're going to see is the frame style binding. This is like a, a alpine binding, but it pivots at the toe and the whole heel piece comes up with you. 
kind of the newer generation is a textile binding where you have two little pins on the toe that mesh with two metal inserts on the toe of your boot and then same on the heel and then don't have one pictured here but it's in a later slide kind of the third category is this hybrid system where you are still touring with yeah so you can't really you can kind of see it on that upper picture but you've got two uh, pins on the toe so you still have the efficiency of tech bindings but you still have this super beefy alpine style heel that skis really well so if you want to jump back up to the frame bindings we'll run through those quickly so frame bindings are the cheapest option out there usually um great way to get into the backcountry this is like if you're still riding the resort most of the time, but you want the option to go check out the backcountry this season, could be a great way to go. Problems are is they're substantially heavier than even regular alpine bindings, let alone tech bindings. And they're just not as efficient. To Izzy's point earlier, like every time you take a step forward, you're having to lift this entire binding. So it does the job. This is what I started on. I didn't want to commit yet. I wasn't sure. I didn't have a lot of money. So I started with these. And after a season, I went with tech bindings. Um, the one other thing with these frame style bindings is in a pinch, you can run standard Alpine ski boots. You don't have the range of motion and it's not as comfortable. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But for that budget setup, you don't necessarily need to go out and buy backcountry specific ski boots. Although it is, it's going to make your day a lot nicer though. So, and then jumping into the pin bindings, tech bindings. You want to jump ahead one? Yeah, thanks. So these are, these are the way you're going to want to go if you're really looking to focus on the back country. Um, they're a lot lighter, less going on. Um, the nice part of these two is it's a more efficient stride. So each step, like it's less weight to carry. And the closer that pivot point is to your toes, the more efficient your step is. That's kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but yeah, just going to be more efficient overall. You can still rip these at the resort. Um, I've skied, I put these on almost every ski I get nowadays because they've gotten to the point where they still ski really well. They're not quite as predictable when it comes to releasing and the feel as Alpine style bindings, but they're pretty darn close. Um, there's thing I missed. Within the textile, there's kind of, there's your like super light option and there's a little bit beefier version. This is just gonna kind of depend on if you're focusing on the uphill, if you're focusing on the downhill. So variations within there, but generally speaking, this is where I'm pushing most people that like, you know, you wanna get into the back country, just make that jump to the tech binding if you can. But a really cool new option that's come to the market over the last couple of seasons is this new like hybrid style. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead, Alex. Yeah, so Solomon Shift, I'm sure a lot of people on the ski side have heard of. And then new this year too is the marker came out with their version, the Duke PT. This is like the updated version of frame bindings. So you're still skiing what looks like regular Alpine binding. So these are gonna ski the best out of any of them, but you get some of that efficiency. You have those pins in the toe. Um, so it's the uphill is gonna be better. That being said, they are still heavier than most of your standard traditional tech bindings, but this is a great like 50-50 option. Like, you know, you're gonna to tour some this season, but you still really wanna prioritize the downhill ride. Um, same goes with more your freestyle rider if you're trying to go in the backcountry and hit jumps and booters and jump off and stuff. Probably want a little bit more than traditional tech bindings. So good way to look or a good thing to look at. They are more expensive, but if this is one ski and that's gonna be your ski to do everything, could be a great way to go. And then one last thing, these have mostly died out, but there are, adapters so you can take a boot and your regular alpine ski um they they work just don't you're good they're called 
day trekkers, but they've got the name day wreckers for a reason. They're just not fun. You're going to have a bad time. So if it gets you out there, that's one thing, but you're going to want to make that jump into some sort of actual backcountry specific finding. This is like the DIY board equivalent, basically. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. yeah. All right, awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, so on to choosing your boots. Um, we got lots of options. Um, so you know, I think one of the first things, and, and I'll kick it to our experts. Um, you know, I think one of the best starting points for boots. Um, is really the boots that you're already in comfort, you know, already comfortable with. Um, I actually used to test boots for Trans World, so got my feet into a lot of boots, especially as the splitboard boot market was emerging. But really, you know, having a boot that you're already comfortable with when you're early on in splitboarding is going to make sure that you have happy longer days and enjoy what you're up to. But then as you get more into it, there is a lot of really great options on the market. Um, you know, 32 makes a couple split boarding boots um, with their MTB. Um, and then uh, K2 makes a really cool boot called the Aspect. Um, you know, some of the things that you're going to be seeing in those boots are, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, fat, negative lean or, or negative um, rain or more range of motion. Um, you're going to see a like split board or a mountaineering shank like the k2 actually has a stiff mountaineering sole so that it actually holds crampons um you know really starting to blend in some more features that are going to allow you to go a little bigger a little longer and and start to use incorporate things like crampons and whatnot um and then um you know really where our guides uh you know our guides on the panel operate in is we have um, you know, the full on, you know, mountaineering, big mountain boots. Um, there is a soft boot fit well, um, and Josh, you're, you're a fit well rider. So, uh, do you want to talk just, uh, quickly about like, what do you like about fit well and, and who's going to be the, the rider, uh, for you, or who's going to be sort of the rider that that boots for? Well, yeah, I mean, like you hit on, um, before though, I just want to reiterate that point is, whatever boot you're first comfortable with, uh, that's what you should get into split boarding with. And not only that, like whatever boot you have from soft board, uh, so solid boarding, not soft boarding, um, just take that, that boot from the resort into the backcountry until you grow out of that boot. You don't need to jump right to the fit well. It's like a progression over time, you know, as you break out, break down the sole um, and start blowing up uh, more resort style boots, then you'll want to upgrade so forth and so on. Um, and it's kind of a progression in uh, these these style split boarding boots. I think the, the Burton Taurus maybe is like the most entry level uh, split board soft boot. And then maybe have the 32s and then the K2s. And I'd say the, the Fitwell boot is, is honestly the closest thing to hard booting. Um, but I think, you know, I can do everything in that Fitwell boot that I think uh, Adam and Izzy said they can do in the hard boot setup. It's just it does take a while to get to riding that boot. The only downside I'd say is that the sole is bigger, um, you know, but things to really keep in mind as you progress is when you want to start uh, booting up coolars, you want something that's semi-auto crampon compatible, um, works much better than the strap crampon, even though you can use that. Um, and yeah, that's the main thing to think about and the super stiff rubber toe. Um, and so yeah, I think soft boot. What's that? I was just say, Josh, what do you mean by, you know, semi-auto crampon? Like, what's the difference between, for people who don't know, the difference between a semi-auto and then like the strap? Yeah. Yeah. So crampons are also a progression. You have full strap crampons, semi-automatic crampons, and then fully automatic crampons. Full strap crampons are maybe the first ones you'll start out with. Semi-automatic crampons have a lever on the heel of the crampon that will fold into the heel welt on these boots. If you can see in the photo on the heel of the Fitwell and the Jones, you can see a noticeable uh, heel welt for that crampon. And then I don't know if uh, Adam and Izzy use full autos, but they can because they, their boots have a toe welt as well, which has a metal bail um, as opposed to a strap. So 
yeah, the boots and the crampons progress with your, your style. Um, but like I said, I think, you know, the fit well is incredibly capable and, and you can do everything in it that you would want to in hard boots. I think at that point, it's just a personal choice, uh, whether you want to break into hard booting or stay a soft booter. I mean, I'm on the fringe, you know, so it's like pros and cons to both. Um, Thank you, Josh. Uh, Izzy, Adam, um, you know, do you have anything sort of to add as far as like what people should be looking for as they're first getting into the, you know, into split boarding or, or anything like that when it comes to boots? I know obviously we'll, we'll kick it to you in a second with, with uh, hard boots, but just sort of for that guiding perspective or when you're offering advice to somebody getting into the sport. Oh, I think Josh nailed it. If you're getting into the sport, start with the boots you already have and then go out, see what you like about that, don't like about it, what you need to fix. Uh, you don't need to go ahead and get something splitboard specific right away. Um, a lot of the boots that you see in that image are kind of a good middle ground between climbing quite well and still being like a softer and more natural, normal snowboarding boot. Uh, those fit wells are awesome for climbing more aggressive things due to the really stiff stole, the, the toe box having a lot of uh, structure behind it. Um, they're great for kicking steps. Like I owned a pair of fit wells for a while and it's what I used like the first time or two. I skied the Grand Teton, I'm sure, to do some ice climbing to get up there. Um, they did make that part easier, but they are quite heavy and they are quite stiff. And personally, I like a pretty soft boot for snowboarding downhill, soft to medium kind of. Um, so they didn't really suit my riding style. Um, I, I think they were the best soft boot for going up um, once my board was on my back, but that stiffness um, didn't work for me very well going down and felt a little bit restrictive for skinning too. So a, a huge amount of this one is personal preference. Um, you're going to have to do a bit of trial and error and hopefully you can do as much as you can in the store rather than in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think just front loading is that, uh, you know, split boarding in the boot that you wear at the resort, it's going to put a ton of wear on that boot. You know, they're not designed to flex when you're, how they do when you're walking. So just taking into consideration, like if you love this boot, just know that it's probably going to blow up pretty soon. If you're spending, you know, 50 days in the back country and, uh, also riding at the resort, they're just not in a traditional Vans boot. It's probably going to blow out if you spend a bunch of time walking in it. Um, so having those stiffer soles, like a Vibram sole, and um, just a bit more catered to the walking motion, I think is something I look out for in a boot, in a soft boot that I'm going to tour in. Totally. And I bet those fit wells probably hold up better than any of the other boots shown there. I bet they've got the durability factor behind them. Cool. Yeah, totally. And, but I'll, I'll back what Izzy's up saying as well, like that, that speaks to that kind of boot progression thing. Um, as you notice, the stiffer boot you end up liking, then you're going to gravitate towards that eventually. Um, but Adam reminded me of one other point that I wanted to make about the, the fit wells is, like he said, they are bulkier. Um, and the sole is bigger than most other boots. So you do have to think about that because in the backcountry, you're going to be riding variable conditions. So you want to make sure that your heel and your toe of the boot are not protruding too far over the edge to where you'll heel out or toe out on a steep condition or a steep line with variable conditions. Um, and you also need to pay attention to this while you're skinning, because if the toe of the boot is too far over your binding, then your split board won't come up as high as you'd like it to, which matters for kick turns. So like we said, there's totally pr pros and cons. Um, and uh, it depends where you're at in your own personal progression and what you value in a boot. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I just saw one question I thought maybe was while we we're on the boots. Uh, I don't, we talked about maybe doing some questions in the middle, but uh, laces versus boa. And I know that I used to be super afraid. I'm just kind of an analog person. I was like, boas could break and I don't know how to fix them. So all my boots will have laces. Uh, but I have a, several pairs of soft boots now that have boas and I just think they're a bit more reliable but I don't know what how do folks feel about wearing using a boa system in the backcountry I think it's I fine I think it's fine I yeah. think it's convenient um laces tend to kind of get a little wet and start stretching and loosening throughout the day and you might need to redo them um 
And that might be hard if your laces are now like a frozen up mass that you can't even undo till you thaw them out. Um, so boas do have that adjustability. And if you want it looser for some parts of your tour and tighter for going down or whatever it is you're into, you can do that. And if it blows, it's rarely catastrophic to the boot. Like we'll talk about what we can in our repair kits later too. But, you know, if, if part of your boot's sloppy, you could probably throw a ski strap around it and you're going to get yourself to the car. It's going to be fine. So it's not going to strand you in the back country if that thing fails. Um, and I personally have never had one fail. And I'm not saying it can't happen, yeah. but uh, it seems like a fairly reliable system. Yeah. All right, moving on. So it's a hard yeah, totally. And also, you'll notice that you'll notice that the K2 and the Fitwells have power straps as well. So those power straps can kind of act as a backup, and then voile straps. Just to note, though, if you are riding a boot that has a BOA system, when you're riding up in the chairlift as well, don't rest your snowboard edge on the BOA system of the opposite boot that you've taken out. Just make sure you don't do that. That's how you blow them. So on to splitboarding hard boots. And I actually have a question because I think, you know, you brought up something, Adam, that I think is probably a little counterintuitive to a lot of people that you say you like a softer, more flexible, playful boot. Um, you know, and I think when people think hard boots, they're thinking either, you know, ski boots, like full on, you know, like, you know, like aggressive ski boots, or they're thinking the old carving boots that I'm not the, you know, the old days of snowboarding. So like, what, can you tell us a little bit more about like, like when you're talking about a hard boot being a softer, more playful boot, that's a really, I think a counterintuitive to a lot of snowboarders. Sure. Yeah. So we kind of talked about with the phantoms already, depending how you adjust them, you can get them to just this perfect tension where they're solidly stuck in the binding, mm -hmm. um, but you can move the boot around in there a bit to lean towards your tail or whatever. Um, now with the boot themselves, the other dimension you need to be able to move or flex a normal snowboard boot would be when you lean over to put weight onto your toes. So you're hinging at the ankle there and having some mobility there is not found in a normal ski boot. People want their ski boots to be quite stiff there. Um, and what we used to do with old Dinafit boots, TLT 5, 6s, speed fits, you know, there was a little hole in the back that you could widen and just make it sloppily move that way. Uh, now we've come to something quite a bit better. So the main system people like these days are the Phantom Link levers. They come stock on the Phantom Slipper boot, which is out this year, and it's the first uh, hard, bo hard booting splitboard boot that's just ready to go out of the box that I would actually recommend to people. Uh, the beauty of this link lever is that it has a spring inside of it that allows movement in the same direction. So you can see it on that top picture on the left there. That lever actually has a spring in it. So when you lean forward over your toes, the upper cuff of the boot moves over with you and that spring in there is interchangeable. So they come in four different stiffnesses depending on how much flex you want out of your boot. Um, part of that preference, part of that's rider weight. So for myself, I use the second out of the four steps with four being the stiffest. So, you know, soft to medium kind of, and I find that suits me pretty well. Um, so you actually do have quite a bit of movement in there. Um, the whole boot isn't stiff. The hard part of the boot we're talking about is more the toe box and the sole. And just, yeah, to get, go into hard boots in general a bit more, the biggest difference they make is on the uphill. So let's start with skinning. It's, it's important to remember that these two different modes, um, we have one mode for uphill, one mode for downhill. So in walk mode, that lever flips up and all of a sudden you have tons of movement. You have an enormous range of motion. Like if you just take your foot right now and kind of point your toes like a ballerina would be on point or something, you can kind of do that in your boot all pretty much to that same degree. And if you lift your toe up towards the sky when you're standing or sitting down, you can probably get that far as well. So a normal soft boot for snowboarding won't let you do that. And having that mobility in walk mode uh, gives you a really nice efficient gait. Um, it's also efficient for going up because like Izzy said, your bindings are in your backpack, more efficient than on your foot and your boot itself is lighter. So the less weight on your foot, the better. Um, and as Alex kind of hinted at in the ski section, having a tech toe, and the pivot point being where it is, is also a natural efficient place to have that movement. So you're basically just gonna skin with less effort. They're also really great 
once your board is on your back and you're boot packing or climbing around. So kind of like we saw in the fit wells there, they do have a rigid toe box. So you can kick this in the firm snow and create a step without totally bashing your toes into the front of your boot and destroying your toenails in the process. They also have a really rigid sole, which makes it good for edging. So if you're on a shallowly kicked snow step or little rock edges, that kind of thing, you can get a lot more purchase out of this boot because it has a rigid sole compared to your average resort soft boot or even most splitboard specific soft boots. Um, and then again, as Josh mentioned, you can use these things with automatic crampons. So those tend to be the most secure option. They tend to be the lightest option and the best for the most aggressive climbing if that's what you end up doing, if you're doing any proper ice or mixed climbing on the way to your objective. So if you're doing that kind of thing, you probably already know this sort of stuff. So I won't go into that in too much detail. Awesome. Um, they're also really modifiable, which I like. So you can punch out the shells to create more room. I do that in my toe box, for example, because my feet are a little bit wider. I give myself extra space there. It feels great in the end. Uh, you can also add foam or plastic to the liners of any boot. Uh, I do a little foam X around my heel that kind of holds my ankle bone down, keeps my heel from rising up. I put a bit of stiff plastic on the tongue so none of the plastic of the hard boot upper kind of digs into me at all. And uh, yeah, we talked about how well they ride downhill and they're also gonna be better for split skiing. It's a pretty solid connection to the toe piece, a bit more so than a soft boot in a separate binding. It's just kind of one less um, degree of freedom, I guess, for movement. And you're just in a ski boot, right? It kind of makes sense that it's gonna ski a little bit better. So you're gonna do that with more ease and a bit more safely, less chance of wiping out. That's not to say you can't learn to split ski quite well in soft boots too, but I do think this is a better tool for the job. Cool. What do you uh, have to say, Izzy? Anything else? No. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thanks, Adam. And thanks, Izzy. Um, so moving on to ski boots, Alex, do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what skiers who are getting into the backcountry should be looking for? You muted I knew out. I was going to do that at some point. Um, <laughs> the main difference is unlike your regular Alpine resort ski boot, this whole upper part of the boot pivots. Usually around, you can kind of see there's a pivot point on all of these boots here. Um, so that's going to let you take a more natural step as a skier, you know how hard it is or can be to walk around in ski boots. So just trying to make that mimic your regular walking step. Um, and then on top of that, so some Alpine boots, that's all they do. The more backcountry specific boots, you have these little inserts that I mentioned earlier. You can see them a little bit better in these pictures where there's inserts in the toe and inserts in the heel. This is what's going to lock into your tech bindings. Um, within the, there's, I don't know, 200 touring boots out there. But generally speaking, there's kind of three categories for the boots too. So you've got in this upper left picture, this is pretty close to your Alpine boot. It's going to ski the best out of all of them, but you can still tour with it. They're heavier, they're less efficient, but if you're really prioritizing the downhill, this could be a good way to go with still having the option to ski or to tour. Um, my personal favorite is this boot down here on the bottom. Um, this kind of bridges the gap where I ski this boot at the resort all the time, but I can still spend all day touring in it. It's really efficient. Um, I think this is the best balance personally. And then if you're really prioritizing the uphill, there's the whole class of these lighter weight bindings. They look a lot like hard boots. A lot of people use something like this for hard boots. Um, but these are super efficient for the uphill. Some of them feel like you're wearing tennis shoes walking uphill. You can't even tell you're in a ski boot. And they sk st still ski reasonably well. They're not going to ski as well as the other two, but they'll get you down the hill. Um, these are getting a lot better over the last couple of years and they're slowly catching up but there's kind of a spectrum just like anything so it's prioritizing the down versus prioritizing the uphill um big things though is 
if you're looking for this backcountry specific boot, this is something you should be comfortable in all day. Yes, you can have comfortable ski boots. I know that's kind of an oxymoron, but working with a boot fitter, you can get them pretty dialed. Um, most of these boots will still fit in your regular Alpine boot. Some of the, or sorry, regular Alpine binding. Um, some of the super lightweight boots don't fit in all Alpine bindings, but generally speaking, you'll be all right. I ski the Scarpa Mistrali down here on the bottom and that's, it's the only, well, almost the only boot I have, but that's what I'm in 90% of the time, be it at the resort or in the back country. And then nice part with these is you can put fully automatic crampons on almost all of them. Um, so if you're looking to do more mountaineering, some people, this is kind of the appeal of hard boots has been mentioned. Like you have great, great purchase if you're putting crampons on, super predictable. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. So on to skins. So this is, I think, a lot of people, uh, you know, there's they kind of gravitate maybe towards just like one thing that happens to be available or, or you know, but there are varying different options and, and some, you know, really good choices on the market. Um, so yeah, what do people need to be looking for when purchasing, uh, purchasing maybe their first pair of skins or, or are there, you know, are there recommendations for, for somebody who's already had a pair, but maybe isn't stoked on it and wanting to try something different? What, what should people know and, and be looking for? Yeah. So first off, you know, skis and split boards are going to require different skins. So the clips on either end are going to be different. Make sure you're getting split board or ski ones, depending on your setup. And if you have a funny shaped tail, like a swallow tail or a, something chopped off, a lot of these PAL specific boards, the standard tail clips that you get might not work for you. Um, so if in doubt, just contact the manufacturer of your boards. Weston does sell tail clips that fit onto Pomoka skins for uh, their boards that require it. So there's an easy, simple solution for you there. Um, and then when you adjust it, just make sure you get that tail clip fairly tight. It shouldn't take all of your strength to put it on, but if it's kind of rattling around on there, it's really not going to do you a whole ton of good. So just make sure you put it on the right setting. When you're actually picking your skins, you want to consider the material they're made out of. So there's two options out there. You got nylon and you have mohair. So nylon is grippier, um, but it's also heavier and at the, all this grip comes at the expense of some glide. So in a perfect world, your skin glides forward with no effort, grips like crazy when you weight it, um, but it, it is in reality gonna be a bit of a trade-off. With mohair, you get more glide and it's lighter weight, more packable, but it's not gonna be as grippy. So in general, it takes a little bit more skill to use a mohair skin. And my favorite ones are a blend of the two. So my skins are 70% mohair and 30% nylon. Um, there's some out there that are 65, 35 also, but something in that range is what I like. So for an advanced skinner or even an intermediate skinner, like if you've already had a full season of split boarding, that'll probably be what you like the most. Um, cool. A thin nylon skin with a bit more grip, something kind of middle of the road could be good for a beginner. It might require less technique and less slipping around when you're first starting. Um, but it is going to be a little bit less efficient once you learn how to use it well. So my skins personally are G3. I use the slipperiest ones called the Glide. Uh, there's one in the middle called the Universal that I think could be suitable for some beginners. And there's a high traction version called the Grip. And I wouldn't recommend that anybody gets high traction skins ever. They're overkill. Um, they're really heavy, really grippy, almost no glide. Um, that extra grip compared to the Universal is not going to make your life any easier. Everything that kind of detracts um, becomes more and more evident at that point. So I wouldn't let anyone get those really. But yeah, minor G3, I think they're great. Pomoka also makes awesome skins. Um, those would be the two brands I would recommend the most. When you're trimming your skins, you just want to get them set up on there so that all of the P-Tex is covered as much as possible and your metal edges are showing all the way. So you can still get some purchase out of them. And then as you're using your skins in the field, you want to flip slides, Alex? Oh, yeah. um, you do have to give this a bit of thought. So you don't want to get snow caked up all onto your glue. 
uh, just try to avoid getting them snowy in the first place. Um, if they do get snowy, they won't stick. So you can scrape that off on the edge of one ski or on a pant leg or both, um, but make sure to maintain them at transitions, especially if they're getting bad. And then when I fold them up to put them away, I don't use any kind of cheat sheet or anything. I just put them glue to glue. If they're a little bit harder to pull apart, I usually put them between my legs and use my legs to help rip them open. Um, but a cheat sheet is just one extra step and one thing that can blow away in the wind, get kind of fumbly. Same with a bag to put your skins in. They all come with a bag. You really don't need to bring that into the mountains with you unless you're putting your lunch in it or something totally separate. Um, and you just generally want to keep them clean. Uh, the glue especially. So, you know, dirt, pine needles, dog hair, any kind of crap like that on the glue is going to get in the way of the glue touching your board and holding the thing on, right? Your glue is going to deteriorate. So make an effort to keep them clean. And if you're getting a bunch of snow globbing up on there in the springtime, especially like hot pow, you know, fresh snow, baking in the sun in the spring, it's probably going to stick to the bottom of your skins. Um, so you can apply skin wax that helps with that to some degree. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. So as temps start to rise, it could be a sensible thing to add to your kit. The other thing I see you go wrong with skins a lot of times is the glue deteriorating. So the kiss of death for my skins is always the point at which the glue starts coming off onto the bases of my board. Um, and it just makes for a, you know, a poor riding surface. And that'll happen more quickly if you dry your skins out in your heat. So don't dry them out near the fireplace or a heater Room temp is fine, just expose the glue. And don't let them get super hot over the summer either. So in the summer, that is when I use a cheat sheet. I'll fold them together with that sheet in the middle and you wanna keep them somewhere cool. So I actually put mine in the freezer. I thankfully have enough room in my freezer at home. I can keep them at normal winter temperatures. Um, but you know, at least you know, if your house is air conditioned and your attic gets to 110 degrees every day, maybe don't keep them in the attic. Give it a little bit of thought at least. Cool. Um, hopefully that covers skins. I know it's a lot of information, but uh, for this whole presentation, there will be a blog post that comes out in about a week, probably on Wednesday, that covers a lot of this. So if you're not catching all of it, no big deal. You can just reference that later on too, or reach out to us individually. Sweet. So poles. Um, split borders obviously need poles for the up, um, not so much for the down, but they can still be useful for the down. So we want our poles to be collapsible. We want them really short for most of our descents, kind of in the middle for touring uphill, skinning, and then really long for pushing through flats, especially if we're split skiing on you know, a frozen lake or an old flat road, something like that. We want them to be durable. Breaking a pole can make it pretty hard to get home. So we wanna make sure we pick a solid option. And you want a big powder basket in there. And it's nice if they're of a design where they can link together. Um, sometimes you can stuff the tip of one pole through one of the baskets and make them one thing that's a little easier to carry. So my recommendation for split borders is a three-piece telescoping pole like you see in those middle two images there. Um, I think they offer the best balance of all of those characteristics. Um, skiers are going to like poles kind of like on the right. They often do like adjustability as well. Um, but they only need a two-piece pole because it doesn't have to collapse down super tiny for the descent ever. The yeah, Z-shaped. Oh yeah, go on. I just get one more thing on the ski side. You can also just use your resort ski poles if they have that powder basket on them. It's really nice to have the adjustability, but if you're just getting into things, you don't, not 100% mandatory. Totally, I'd agree. Um, yeah, you don't necessarily need that. Um, some people like really short poles for powder skiing, especially, um, and longer for going up or pushing through flats, but it's far from mandatory. Now, what you'll see a lot of split borders use are poles like you see on the left there. They're kind of a compactor style or a Z pole, something like that. And they're made for split borders. And the advantage is that they do get a little bit shorter and some people can put them into their pack. That being said, I don't use them. I find that they've been far less durable than telescoping poles. I've broken more of those than I can count. Um, I know Ben Hilly, who many of you probably know um, through these Weston talks has broken loads. Josh was saying yesterday, he's probably broken like 15 of them or something like that. I'm not sure if he's totally serious, but uh, yeah, I've just found them failing me endlessly. Oh, and I'm totally serious. Them. Yeah. So, you know, maybe if- Why you did you wait for 15 poles to break? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if yeah, it's- Yeah, warranty. Really 
getting them for free. Okay. <laughs> I played that game for a while too, but like as you know, as you did, I got fed up with it. Um, if it's really important, you get your poles in your pack. If you're filming or something, and it's important for the aesthetics, like sure, maybe they have a place. Um, but I, I don't like them, and I don't recommend that people get them. Um, I find it's faster and easier too. It transitions to strap my poles to the outside of my pack. I just put them on the side that um, is near the tail of my board, so I'm not facing towards it as I'm riding. And you know, I've tomahawked plenty like that. Nothing bad's ever come of it. They do stick up a little bit, but uh, it seems to be just fine. Cool. Anything else to add on poles, gang, or on to the next one? Moving on. All right, layering. So. I think, you know, what we've talked about is a lot of the, like, you know, I think especially in bindings and boots and all that, that's, I think the really, the sexy stuff of split boarding that everybody gets excited about. Um, but layering really is probably, I think one of the more important things. And one of the things that's the biggest challenge for a lot of people going from resort to the back country. Um, Cause I think a lot of people tend to dress super warm for the resort cause they're, they're not putting that effort in. So understanding how to appropriate layer, how to manage moisture and sweat, all that's a really important skill. So uh, Izzy, do you want to like talk people through sort of what, how to build a layering system that works for, for the variety of temperatures you're going to deal with um, throughout the day while split boarding? Totally. Um, I mean, obviously it's person to person. Some people run hot, some people run cold. Um, but what I always like to break it down into is you need a wicking layer, something that pulls sweat off your body, warm layers that are insulating, trapping heat that you're working really hard to create, and then weather protective layers, so the three W's, that's how I remember it. Um, so I'm generally a t-shirt person, or I guess, let me back up. Most of the things that you wear at the resort, you can then ride in, in the backcountry. The biggest difference is a lot of people tend to have heavy jackets that they run the resort because you ride in a lift, it's super cold, and uh, there's a little bit more uh, staying stationary at the resort, waiting in lines, things like that. But in the backcountry, you're touring, you're taking a break, you're moving again, the weather's constantly changing. So um, having layers, nothing that one layer is too heavy is what I find really important. So I wear a thin t-shirt. I don't generally like a long sleeve shirt on my base layer, but something that's a merino um, and or some kind of polyester synthetic material. Cotton doesn't actually kill, doesn't, I don't think anybody's death has been attributed to cotton, but um, it doesn't keep you warm and it's gonna keep you cold if you're sweating in it. It's not gonna dry quickly. So that's why people really advocate for the use of merino and synthetic, especially on those base layers. You wanna pull the sweat off your body so that when you do take a break, you're not uh, cooling off super quickly and you're not just getting soaked. So that's key for me. Um, and then I just like to build on that. So, you know, on the slide here, it says insulating layers, insulating mid layers, fleece down synthetic. Um, I personally don't have a lot of fleece mid layers. Uh, they're just bulkier. Like technology with fabrics has advanced so much that you can get a down jacket or a synthetic puffy jacket that gets down to nothing and it's gonna have a much larger, larger warmth to weight ratio. So mid-weight puffy is something like uh, Patagonia Micro Puff or an Arteryx Atom jacket. I've had you know, a ton of different jackets and I don't have a strong preference. And personally, it's like, there's just brands I like to support. So it goes off for that more so. And then uh, outer shell, or I guess bottoms, pretty similar like I just have a light legging or long john that I wear um, nothing too heavy because my legs just stay pretty hot um, as far as outer shell material this kind of when it gets into you know where do you live what are you doing you know if you live out in the pacific northwest you're going to want really good Gore-Tex the snow there just tends to be higher moisture content versus if you live in Colorado you can get away with touring most of the winter without you know, top of the line Gore-Tex. Um, you could wear something that's a little bit more breathable, more of a soft shell material. Uh, personally, I just keep a hard shell jacket on me at all times because I like that weather protection. Um, things that I find key about that are having vents in the armpits. Uh, 
some jackets will have it in the chest, but armpits is huge for me because you can dump a ton of heat. So if it is storming and you find yourself touring in your shell, you can still you know, manage your heat pretty well. But I don't tour in my shell all that often, you know, a dozen days a year. Um, and then, yeah, as far as pants, I like a mix, you know, sell a lot of pants that'll have hard shell in the front and more of a soft shell material on the back hamstrings, but I don't mind a soft shell pant. For me, what I look for is, um, you know, does it fit over a snowboard boot? Does it have an internal gaiter? And uh, can I put my beacon in the thigh pocket? Uh, I don't like to carry my, my beacon or my avalanche transceiver in the chest harness that they often come with. I prefer to carry it in my pants for accessibility. Uh, so I like a pant that has a beacon specific pocket uh, on the thigh. Yeah. And then uh, my big puffy jacket, I call it my oh shit layer. It just lives at the bottom of my pack. It's not something that I really account for in my, my day's planning of what I expect. You know, if it's 25 degrees, I probably never going to put that puffy on. That's the goal. Uh, but I still bring it in case of emergency. It's it's part of my layering, but it's also part of my emergency first aid equipment. If I get hurt or a partner gets hurt and they're going to be laying down in the snow, I want to have something to help keep them warm. Um, so that's huge for me. And and I I like a synthetic parka. Uh, I have a Patagonia DOS and it gets down pretty small, but. Uh, I like synthetic for something that I'm going to wear on the outside. You know, if I'm digging pits, I'm going out to get some information on the snow and I'm going to stand still in a storm. I'd, I'd rather have synthetic insulation um, or down or waterproof treated down. Uh, and then glove layering isn't on the slide, but I just think it's important to know, like I have a set of gloves that I tore in that get super sweaty because um, I guess I have sweaty hands. And then a set of gloves that I ride in uh, because I just have bad circulation. So I want to have a set of dry gloves. And that's also part of my risk management, making sure I'm not dealing with a cold injury out in the mountains. Um, yeah, I think. I don't know if anybody else has things they think about in their layering or a piece that they really like. I think that was great. I think uh, the one thing that most people struggle with when they first get into touring is their pants. Um, I would agree with Izzy where in like hybrid pants, there may be mostly hard shell and have some soft panels in the hamstring or the bib are awesome. Um, soft shell pants can work well for some people too. Um, but the key is to have some degree of breathability. Gore-Tex or full hard shells just get sweaty and clammy. Uh, you're going to generate a lot of body heat. So I like, I have some North Face ones. There's a material feature light. Um, they have the purest bib that I think is sweet because it's a good blend of weatherproofness and breathability. Um, but whatever you get, just, I urge you to think about the breathability of your pants. You can't change them when you're out there in the field. So you're kind of stuck with what you got. Um, and yeah, if you're uphill most of the day, make sure you have a pant that works for you on the uphill. I guess just to, uh, piggyback off that is look for pants that also have vents. Um, like talk about armpit vents in the jacket, same thing, a pant that has some thigh vents, uh, huge. Okay. Great. So on to Avi gear. This is probably one of the single, the single most important thing um, that you'll buy and have with you as you and your partner's life depends on this gear. So um, Adam, take us away. Tell us, you know, what what should you know? Well, starting with the beacon, you know, what what do you like to use? What should we all be looking for? Um, you know, what are some, what are some good tips, tips and tricks when buying your, at buying your first, or, or maybe when is a good, also another good question is when is a good time to upgrade your beacon as well? Cool. Um, so yeah, beacons, you know, you might also hear them called transceivers. They're the same thing. And the standard these days is to have a three antenna design. Um, so there won't be any, uh, transceivers. I don't think on the market anymore that you can purchase new that don't have three antennas, but some older models might not. Um, it's really nice to have a marking function too. Um, and not everyone has gone out to say that it's, you know, fully mandatory these days, but in my head, it pretty much is, um, to handle multiple burials. If you identify one victim and need to move on to find someone else, you don't want to be distracted by that signal that you already located. 
Um, so I think a standard marking function that just masks that signal is ideal. You'll see other transceivers with different types of functions, but they often have some type of special search mode to let you solve that problem. So make sure you have something like that. And a normal marking function is my favorite way to do it. Um, having a long range is a plus. You'll see numbers ranging from 40 to 70 meters on most transceivers. This one pictured here is my favorite. It's the Barry Vox S from Mammoth. Um, it actually has a special mode that lets you have a range of 100 meters um, when you're first obtaining a signal. Um, you also want to just get your beacon checked up from time to time. So some of them, these ones in particular, have updatable software. You can bring them into a shop to have that done. You also want to subject it to some kind of testing device or the group check mode on this one will do this for you. But it actually keeps your, it'll assess the frequency your transceiver's um, operating at and what type of pulse it's giving off. So as transceivers and or beacons age, that part tends to change a little bit and it might compromise its performance. Um, so you do wanna just give some thought as to um, at least having it assessed in that way. And this device will do that for you. Um, but regardless, even if it says that it's in good shape, I wouldn't keep any device more than 10 years. Personally, I switch mine out probably more like every five years or so. Um, but 10 years is the upper, upper limit. Um, you wanna be conscious of what kind of batteries you're putting in the thing. Alkaline batteries will work in any transceiver and only a handful of transceivers can actually use lithium batteries. So lithiums last longer, do a little better in the cold, um, but it's really important you give some thought as to what you're using. Um, and you also really need to think about where you're keeping your transceiver and what it's near. So you have to store it in a dedicated pocket that's meant for it, attached properly or in the harness it came with. And you need to be aware of interference with any type of metal. So our most common culprits are electronics, you know, cell phones, GoPros or whatever. You gotta stay 20 centimeters or eight inches away. Um, and keep in mind that things could shift around in an avalanche and really avoid transmitting technologies, Bluetooth. You don't wanna be controlling your GoPro with your phone, that kind of thing. But whatever you end up owning, um, it's important that you understand all of its functions and practice with it, figure out its intricacies, um, get to know it like the back of your hand. Um, this one has a few other features I really like for an advanced user. It lets you hear analog audio and has a variety of special modes for solving really tricky problems. Um, if you dive into this deeper, you'll find that this has answers to a lot of the issues you might run into in a problematic search. Um, quick rapid fire, Adam, sounds like you use the Mamut. Um, Izzy, Josh, what beacons do you use? And just real quick. I also use the Mamut. Um, but the one thing about the Mamut that I know it's real quick to note is it has a feature on it that will detect a heartbeat. Um, but it is only useful if everyone else in your party also has that same beacon. Awesome. Thanks. All right. On to shovels. What cool. should we what should we be looking for? Or is there anything else to add on beacons? No, that's great, I think. Um, yeah, shovels are pretty simple. You'll see some crappy ones out there with plastic blades. Don't even think about that. Get a metal blade. Um, it's nice if the cutting edge of the blade is pretty smooth, not a bunch of ribs um, that would leave funny shaped uh, pit walls if you're digging a snow pit. Uh, you need to make sure you have an extendable shaft of some sort. It's more anatomical. You'll move snow more quickly. And a, a sort of hoe mode is great. Um, this one you see pictured here is the Black Diamond EVAC 7. And depending on which way you attach the blade to the shaft, it could either be a normal shovel or a hoe. So in Avalanche Rescue, having a hoe is great for people that aren't digging right up next to the probe. Um, the people behind can tend to move more snow more quickly with a shovel in hoe mode. Um, and I like it for other things in my life too, you know, fixing corners on skin tracks, digging out helipads, stuff like that. Um, so I think it's a great feature, but it tends to be associated with a shovel that's a little less packable and tougher to get in your bag. So this one fits in my bag fine. It's no big deal. Um, if you want a more compact shovel uh, that lacks a hoe mode, G3 has one called the Avi. I think it's just the Avi shovel. Um, and that one works pretty well too. Cool. Okay, probe. So your other final key piece of Avi gear here. Um, you'll see all kinds of probe lengths. You might see some as short as 200 centimeters, a lot kind of start at like 240, something like that. 
you need a long probe. So when it comes to probing, your partner is going to care both about the length and how you use it. So 300, 320 centimeters is kind of the normal range. Um, not only is it better for avalanche searches um, and rescues um, for obvious reasons, right? Like if someone's buried deeper than you can probe, you're going to have a real hard time finding them. But it's also great for um, probing corniced ridge crests, figuring out where the ground is. And on a glacier, um, 300 centimeters is often kind of a cutoff in my head for, you know, well bridged crevasses and maybe questionable crevasses. So having something that gets you to that length helps my decision making. There's lots of factors to consider when it comes to roping up on a glacier, but that's just one of them. Um, I also think it's important to think about the length of the segments of a probe. So this one from Black Diamond has 40 centimeter segments. I think that fits into the avi pocket of most backpacks a lot better than probes with 45 centimeter segments. It sounds like a really small difference, but it makes a big difference in the, how it fits in your backpack. Um, and I do have a slight bias towards aluminum probes over carbon. I've just broken a couple carbon ones. Aluminum is not indestructible, but uh, I do think it's a little bit more durable. Cool, backpacks. Um, yeah, you obviously ought to carry more stuff with you than you would at the resort. 30 to 40 liters is probably a pretty standard volume. You can get away on the lower end if your helmet's on the outside. If you want your helmet inside, you should probably go closer to 40. Uh, make sure you got a, an Abbey specific pocket, a place to store your probe, your shovel, maybe a snow saw if you have one, maybe even an ice axe if you got a shorty. And make sure you got some kind of function to get into the, the deeper parts of your pack without unloading the whole thing. So some kind of side zip, side zip or removable back panel is usually pretty good for that. You'll want to think about how your skis or snowboard can attach to it for boot packing too. So it's nice to have a couple straps on either side that let you A-frame your skis or board, or if you're a split boarder, also having um, a way to just vertically carry your snowboard in snowboard mode. Um, I usually carry my board uh, in ski mode. I find that to be the most comfortable. Um, most backs will have a loop or some other attachment to put an ice axe on. That can be great for a lot of folks. Um, and having some kind of smaller compartment near the top to put loose items, have you know sunscreen, sunglasses, maybe some of your tools, a ski strap, whatever, just little things that you wanna have accessible. Um, it's good to have uh, some place to put those. Um, cool, you guys have anything else to add? Just as far as like a, what is a women's specific pack, really the biggest difference is just going to be torso size. So women's pack will generally have a smaller torso, um, but it's, you know, there's a lot of great packs that don't have gender specific uh, marketing out there that are great. Like the Patagonia packs are great, Black Diamond packs are awesome and, and they make a small, I wear a small medium in most packs and I'm fairly short. So uh, don't feel limited to women specific packs. Another thing about packs to think about is um, durability. Like when you start split boarding, split board mountaineering, you start running through packs. Um, and some pack companies have really great warranty programs if the materials themselves aren't as durable as more high end packs. Um, so just think about that when, when you're looking at the specific brand you want to purchase. Cool. Great. Um, so yeah, we'll keep our discussion of airbags relatively brief. Um, they, first off, are absolutely not a substitute for any kind of proper backcountry and avalanche education. You know, the rest of your safety gear, all the relevant skills. It's not a get out of jail free card. A lot of people who die in avalanches also die from trauma. And the protection offered by an airbag there is pretty limited. Um, that being said, it will make it a lot harder for an avalanche to bury you. It tends to keep you near the surface during a slide. Um, most people do not tour with airbags. It is a personal choice and there's nothing wrong with deciding that you want to tour with one, but it is heavier and bulkier and most people find it to be a bit of a hindrance. Um, and you certainly don't want it to cloud your decision-making and start dropping into lines just because you have an airbag on your back. Um, if you are going to buy one, it's worth thinking about the type of system that it uses. So some use compressed air, some use nitrogen, some use a fan. Uh, my favorite system right now, just because it's light and small, is the Alpride system. It's a couple tiny canisters. 
Um, fans are nice for some reasons too. Um, they keep blowing air in for quite a, usually three minutes or so. So it'll stay inflated even with small punctures. It'll deflate if it's buried to create a nice big air pocket. Um, it runs on a battery and you can usually get a few deployments out of it. That being said, if you're on a day when you're pulling your airbag more than once, you've made some huge errors and should probably be going home anyway. <laughs> um, if you own an airbag, you'll probably pull that cord every like 10 years or less, right? So um, multiple deployments in a day isn't a huge thing for me. Um, but yeah, if you're gonna buy an airbag, go through all those same normal backpack considerations we just talked about. If you buy a slick airbag system with a pack that kind of sucks and is inconvenient to use, you're never gonna bring it. So really think hard about the actual functions of the pack and not just the airbag system. Quick rapid fire. Another who, key thing. Who uses bag, uh, airbags? So no, it, I don't it, use them. Sometimes. Yeah. I, I would throw another two cents in about airbag for um, consideration really quick is uh, also the terrain you ride, um, the terrain in your zone, how much of it is alpine, how much of it is below tree line. Um, you know, in Colorado, we have a lot of below tree line riding and I see a lot of airbags in those zones. And um, that's a consideration, you know, if you do get swept down through any tree type terrain, um, it may get popped. And that's where those fan bags are the only thing that will continue to reinflate in that instance. Um, another thing is, I notice um, some people who do avalanche education these days are saying that this is a fourth piece of, you know, the avalanche rescue and safety gear. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that and don't think it should be lumped into that category of a beacon shovel probe. I think it's just another personal choice. It's another item out there um, that you can use if you'd like. Adam hit on a lot of the points there, um, specifically mentally, you know, don't think like, oh, I've got an airbag, I can charge into whatever line. Um, so these are just all things to consider um, in your thought process when you decide if it's for you or not. Izzy, you were saying you use yours sometimes. So when would be a time you use it? Um, oftentimes guiding, if, you know, the, my people I'm out with don't have avalanche education training. So I don't trust that uh, they could find me or dig me out. So I want to give myself an advantage. Um, or if I feel like the terrain that I'm riding, the avalanche is what's going to kill me first, which is kind of a morbid way to look at it. But a lot of the terrain in the Tetons, it's like, you're going to go off a cliff before you get buried in an avalanche. So in my mind, it's like, it's not worth the wait. It's a, it's going to slow me down and time is of the essence in that kind of terrain. So, uh, but if I'm going to ride bigger terrain, deeper snow, then I'll, I'll bring it. But uh, we just have a lot of really big cliffs and that's trauma is usually what gets you first. So. All right. Awesome. All right. Moving on communication. Um, so this is another often overlooked but really important tool for the backcountry. Um, being able to communicate clearly with your partners uh, can be, uh, you know, a matter of, of life or death uh, as far as, uh, you know, how you're all moving through the mountains as a group. So, yeah, what, what do you all use for communication? What do you recommend for somebody who maybe hasn't used, uh, you know, a radio before, but is like, oh boy, I need to get one. What, what should people be looking to get? And then also, you know, what's the story with the GPS stuff? You know, is, is that something people should be considering? And, and when is that a, a good applicable use? Yeah, so um, it's kind of delineated here. Uh, radios are often between you and your party members. You know, the BCA link, they're, they're between BCA link communication. So it's great, especially on storm days, hard to see your partners um, or in bigger training, you just communicate because you're skiing one at a time. Uh, it will make your day smoother if you're not yelling in the woods, hey. Uh, so I like radios for efficiency, but I don't always bring them. Um, just, you know, if I have a lot of stuff in my pack, but, but they're a great thing if you have them or you have you know, a couple people that you ride with and you're all willing to invest in it. It's pretty awesome. Uh, the BCA radio is different from what you might see. Um, if you, if you have a local, you know, ski guiding service, guides will carry UHF radios. Um, and those have different channels that they can get on. And, uh, we just want to have generally have public users on different channels. So there's not interference in case there's a rescue operation going on. 
satellite communication that's part of my my rescue oh shit kit uh, there's a couple of different versions there's Garmin makes what they call an inReach, um, and they have a couple of different versions of that, but that's more of a GPS style in its uh, largest form where you could make a track on a mapping website, plug it in, and use that as a GPS, as well as use it as an SOS function. So what's cool about the inReach is that you can actually send out text. It's not a call, it's a text, uh, but you could be communicating with rescuers. It's really important in my mind to know when and where you have cell phone service because if i know that i have service in an area like on any of the east bases in the tetons i'm pretty sure i have i know where i have service so i'll just bring an extra battery for my phone and i won't bring the inreach uh, because i have this bigger model now inreach makes uh, a mini that's you know the size of a tic tac box and you can combine that with your phone so you can text through your phone and use this small gps interface and communicate uh, versus something like the spot you can hit the SOS button and you can program like one or two messages, I'm okay or I need help, but they just have less of a place in my pack because you can't communicate what you need, what the state of the injury is, where you are. Um, your coordinates will go to a number, but uh, I like the inReach style devices and I always carry them in my pack. Um, if you're into podcasts, the Fine Line podcast, which is put on through Teton County Search and Rescue, they just had an episode and uh, the folks involved in it was a mountain biking accident, but they just had a blip of service and had they been a mile away, they wouldn't have been able to contact SAR search and rescue and the situation would have ended a lot differently. So it's a short podcast. Um, I felt like it really drove home the importance of carrying something like this in your pack. Uh, I'd really recommend investing in something like an inReach for everybody. So here's a quick thought question. Oh, I want to add one thing on if somebody has, you know, a limited budget, but they are really wanting to like take their safety gear more seriously in reach or airbag in reach in reach, in reach. all day long, every day. Yeah. The in yeah there's so will much get more you help. To it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to add one little thing about radios too. Um, I, I think it's great that, that people are using them and finding out how to use them and making good choices on that. But um, let, it's, it's similar to me as the airbag in a sense, whereas you don't want to rely on it as a crutch to drive you to make certain decisions. Um, like you still need to ski in the backcountry, like maybe you don't have radios. Um, and like, as he mentioned as well, like the BCA links, they're not for reaching out for help. Um, you need to have the in reach for that. But um, but yeah, radios are great. I just, you know, a, a quiet radio is a happy radio is all I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's a listening device, not a talking device. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, so first aid kit, uh, what do you all carry? You know, what do you recommend for sort of a starter first aid? Give us the lowdown for, for what we all should be carrying in case the, you know, the worst happens. Yeah, so this photo shows a bit more than I would normally carry, honestly. Um, when you're out there, kind of be realistic about what you hope to accomplish with your first aid kit. You're not gonna like set up to operate on someone. You're, you also don't really need to solve really minor issues. Like if someone has a little upset stomach and you can give them some Tums, maybe it helps a little, but was it worth carrying them around in your pack for the last like six years waiting for this moment? Probably not. So the things I really wanna focus on are having a CPR mask for avalanche victims, being able to control bleeding, do some basic splinting and to keep a patient warm and ultimately figure out a way to evacuate them from the field if they can't do it under their own power. Um, of course, you should supplement with anything specific to your own needs. If you have an EpiPen or certain medications, obviously you want to bring those with you. Um, and you don't have to go totally nuts with the quantities here, um, especially if multiple people in your party have a first aid kit. Um, yeah, keep that in mind. There's probably going to be some redundancy out there. Uh, do consider the remoteness of where you're going and kind of the duration of your trip. You're doing some huge week long traverse. You're probably gonna wanna bring a little bit more than if you're just like skiing next to the highway for the afternoon. 
Uh, my basic kit kind of is listed out here. Basically, you know, I'm just going to let you read through it, but a bit of tape, uh, gauze. Um, I like those Steelux packs. It's a blood clotting thing. Uh, but yeah, stuff to just kind of keep clean. Um, and then that leg splint, I think, is a pretty important piece to carry. So you'll see a lot of things called SAM splints out there. Uh, there's a company called Alpine Threadworks out of Canmore that makes a leg splint I think is awesome. It's really compact. I bet it compresses to like a deck of cards or smaller, but it's just a piece of uh, kind of tent material almost, like a sill tarp with little loops sewn in it. And you just slide ski poles through and that adds all the rigidity. Um, so I think that's the best, um, most effective tool for its weight. And it's gonna be more effective for a leg injury than a SAM splint would be anyway. Um, you also want to be prepared to, you know, maybe spend a night where you're going if you really run into trouble um, and have some kind of rescue sled for hauling someone out of the mountains. So when someone gets hurt, there's a couple things that you wanna consider beyond just treating their immediate injury. You wanna keep them warm. So pulling out that big oh shit jacket um, is key. Load them up with jackets, get them off the surface of the snow. Uh, sitting on packs is great. When it's really, really cold, I might even carry a tiny sleeping pad, one that's like the size of a beer can. Um, and if I'm not gonna get them home in a helicopter, we're probably gonna have to haul them out of there. So I always have um, this thing called a ski guides rescue tarp. You know, it's also from Alpine Threadworks and it can be used as a sled to haul someone out of the mountains. Uh, if you do that, you do need to attach a couple pieces of cordelette to it. So everyone should carry a couple, you know, maybe five meter lengths of cord. Um, or if each person has one, that's pretty good. So you can actually haul someone around. And this thing can also be used to help make an improvised shelter if you find yourself spending the night. Uh, it's also worth keeping in mind that if someone gets hurt and you're moving them, you're gonna move pretty slowly. So that's just one more reason to always have a headlamp in your backpack. Um, even if you're pretty close to the car, it might take you a long time to get there. Um, and it gets dark pretty early in the winter in a lot of places. So keep that in mind. Uh, not every single item here has to be in everyone's pack, right? Like a sled, um, you know, if you have a sleeping pad, that kind of thing, like just one per group is fine. And if you have a big group, maybe not even everyone has to have a first aid kit. Maybe two or three is enough for a group of five or six people. Um, but whatever approach you take, do learn how to do a bit of basic first aid. So if you can take a course like a woofer, wilderness first responder, or OEC, outdoor emergency care, those are great places to start to build a bit of knowledge. Sweet, you guys want to add anything or should we just keep- I'll, I'll do here? one quick add on to the first aid kit. Sorry, Adam. Um, so like mountain medicine is getting a lot of stuff from military medicine now. Um, so uh, like he said, the Sealox pads, um, the blood clotting things, those things are awesome um, as well are tourniquets. So just a kind of thing that's added to mountain medicine to really think about putting in your kit. Yeah, there are times I carry a commercial tourniquet in my kit. In a pinch, you could make a somewhat poor one out of a ski strap. Um, it's There's probably not that many injuries that I can imagine skiing that end up requiring a tourniquet, which is why I don't end up carrying it every day. But um, I go back and forth on that one. I think it's a totally reasonable thing to consider adding to your kit. Izzy, do you have anything to add to first aid? All right. Cool. Um, so yeah, repair and emergency, making sure that you can get yourself back out uh, to your car, to the trailhead, um, you know, requires having spare parts and extra pieces. So what are some of the essentials that you recommend everybody carry and have? So that way they aren't, uh, you know, boot packing through waist deep pow for 10 miles back to their car. <laughs> yeah. So being stranded on poorly functioning equipment can turn into a real hazard. Um, if you're spending the night somewhere cold, you know, if you can't skin, you could end up dead. Right. So. Um, being able you can fix some of this stuff on your own is pretty important. Uh, and make sure that your kit's specific to your own equipment, especially your bindings and your board, uh, maybe even your boots. So I like to bring one, of ex one extra screw of each type that's associated with my kit. It's really only a few screws. Um, and make sure you have screwdrivers that are appropriate for those types of heads. I carry a little tool like the spark one you see here, as well as a Leatherman. 
the knife and pliers on a Leatherman can come in pretty handy as well sometimes. Um, one or two ski straps, they're so versatile, definitely worth carrying. Um, and then I think a bit of paracord and bailing wire can be great for forming attachments, um, kind of improvising solutions. Um, I often bring a few wood screws in case I have to remount a toe piece or something. It's never happened, but they really don't weigh too much. Um, and then some people like to carry an extra ankle pivot for ski boots or hard snowboarding boots. Um, it's pretty rare that that would fail, but it does happen sometimes. Um, so depends on how thorough you want your kit to be. It's also worth making sure you always have extra batteries. So if people's batteries in their transceiver run out or maybe say your headlamp, um, it's worth having some extras, but it's worth thinking about how they're sitting in your pack. So if the ends are touching, they can lose their charge over time if you form a circuit with them and then your spare batteries are dead. So I just put mine all in a wad kind of parallel to each other and tape them together. Um, so they're all aligned and the ends can't actually touch. Um, so I do think that's a, a precaution worth taking. Uh, uh, this kind of overlaps with first aid a bit, but I do always have a lighter and some kind of fire starter with me too. So like an old bike tube that you shred up can be used to start a fire in damp conditions or cotton balls soaked in Vaseline, something like that to just ease, you know, make it a little easier on you since you're in a damp spot with maybe live wood, that kind of thing. Um, one of the most common, I think, day ruiners that happens for a lot of people who are first getting into it, um, especially where you're doing like shorter, maybe going out to like a glade and lapping it a few times is having your skins lose grip um, and then not being able to re-adhere to the board, which then can mean not being able to skin out. What's sort of a good, like, what do you recommend carrying for that? So that way you're not like, oh no, I can't reattach my skins to my, my split and skin out. Well, we talked about maintaining your skins, right? So just scraping snow off, using your ski edge and maybe finishing on your pants periodically at transitions will help avoid that problem in the first place. And if it's super cold, keeping them in your jacket for a little bit, bit might help warm up the glue and get it to stick better. Uh -huh. um, if that is not enough, ski straps are pretty much the answer there. Um, so make sure your straps are long enough to make it all the way around your setup. Um, but if you throw you know, two or three of those on each foot, that'll get you out. And it doesn't mean you have to carry six ski straps yourself. Like your buddies are probably gonna have some that they're not using too. Um, so don't be afraid to just strap that on if it's just sliding around like crazy. Just recognize you won't have much glide, but you will be able to walk. Awesome. Anything else on repair and emergency kit? And one note, we are gonna have a blog as Adam mentioned. So you'll be able to kind of go through and digest all of this stuff so you can start building your own kit um, or add to your kit if you feel like you found out, oh, I didn't know I needed that, so. Yeah, as you guys can tell, I'm kind of ripping through some of this, expecting if you got questions, you can refer to the blog or just reach out to one of us directly. We're all happy to answer questions on an individual basis too. Cool. Then some other additional things uh, just to have on our mind. Helmets, um, you know, this is my personal opinion, but uh, I think having a helmet in the backcountry is super important as, uh, you know, if, if TBIs and head injuries are, are really hard to deal with. Um, I know I actually broke my neck mountain biking and, you know, I was wearing a helmet and it would have been way worse if I wasn't. So I'm a big helmet advocate. But what do you all think of helmets in the backcountry? Um, and then what should people be looking for? You know, is the helmet that they have for the resort perfectly fine? All that. Um, yeah. So first off, like you said, I don't think this is optional. A helmet should be a mandatory piece of equipment for all skiing and snowboarding, including in the backcountry. Um, yeah, whatever you have for the resort is probably totally fine to start with, um, especially if you're going on fairly standard tours where you don't need a helmet at all for the up and you only need it for the down, your resort helmet's fine. You don't need to rush out and buy a new helmet. Um, I wear mine all the time any, for any descent. So that's snowboarding and split skiing both. Um, or anytime I'm exposed to falling objects. So, you know, think rock fall, if things are melting, you know, ice from Seracs, snow mushrooms or cornices coming down. Uh, those are all gonna do some damage if they clock you in the head. And I also wear it anytime I could take a long fall. So if I'm at the top of a long firm slope or on an exposed ridge crest, I put my helmet on for that too. 
So because I'm sometimes wearing my helmet for uphill travel, I really want it to have good venting. So some helmets have vents you can open and close. Um, those are great. So they can be closed when it's snowing out or cold and open for you know, high output activities. Um, I would steer you towards one of those. I also like to get rid of the ear flaps. So most ear flaps and helmets are removable. I find it packs into my backpack a lot easier. Um, and it's just not gonna be as warm, right? You can always have a buff or a beanie underneath for warmth when you need it. But when you're pouring sweat, booting up a cooler, wearing your helmet, um, it's nice to have the option of having as little on your head as possible. Um, so yeah, I think it's better for heat management, fits in your bag better. I also like it for working around helicopters so I can wear ear protection over top. Um, you definitely don't want any kind of audio plugged into your helmet. Um, you know, especially if it's Bluetooth, that's no good with your transceiver. And you just need to be able to hear in the mountains. Your partner might be yelling avalanche or you might hear a rumble behind you or they're just telling you like, there's a cliff there, you gotta go left. And you're just like shredding along in your own world and you end up blowing it, right? So um, I wouldn't distract yourself with music for backcountry riding. Um, some helmets I like. So there's a couple Smith ones I've used. This one, here's the Vantage. I have the Variants too. It's a good, pretty warm, um, you know, just general helmet. Um, you see it on the right there, open and closable vents. I also have that one on the top left. It's from Salomon, the uh, Mountain Lab. Um, it's really light. It's also rated for climbing as well. Um, it vents super well. Um, so all, at first this all sounds great, but it's actually a little bit of a bummer when it's dumping snow because those vents don't close. But Salomon makes a different one down at the bottom there called the QST Charge. Super similar, except it's got vents that open and close. That's kind of what I wish I had, but I'm not about to go out and buy a new helmet because I have stuff I like enough at least. Um, yeah, that would be my top recommendation. I think that QST charge, but there's lots of good options out there. Just look at the weight and the venting more than anything and some kind of dial in the back to make sure it's secure on your head, proper fit. Wicked. All right, so the rest of the items we're gonna cover here, you don't need to bring for every single day of ski touring. Um, so what we're going to go over next are ski crampons, boot crampons, and ice axes. And most days, I don't bring any of those. Um, but when you need them, you really need them, and they can make all the difference. So ski crampons are something that can enhance your skinning capabilities when you're on really firm, icy surfaces. So these go on and you use them in conjunction with your skins. You'll sacrifice some glide going uphill and pretty much all your glide going downhill. So you can't sneak down a little descents anymore when you have your skins on with these guys. You kind of have to roll your ankle a bit when you use them most of the time to get as much contact with those spikes um, and get them sunk into the snow as possible. Um, so it is a bit of a technique to learn and knowing when to apply them takes a bit of judgment. So they're really great for moderately angled, firm, smooth slopes that you can't tackle with skins alone but they don't work super well on uneven surfaces. They can still work if you're really careful with where you put your feet, um, but imagine just the two ends of your ski bridging on bumps and your ski crampon in the middle here. Um, if it's not touching anything because of funny shaped snow surfaces, it's not gonna do its job and you're gonna slide. Um, they also don't work well on really steep slopes. So as the angle increases, you know, boot crampons and an ax are probably gonna be a better choice for you. And I urge you to use a lot of caution when you're using these, um, both as you commit to a slope and as you think about where you're gonna transition. So because you're using these in firm conditions, those are also the kind of conditions where if you start sliding, it's really hard to stop yourself. And the last thing you wanna do is start ski cramponing up a long slope, get near the top, it gets steeper or more funky, whatever. And you realize that they're not gonna get you to the top. Now you're in a position where you can't just reverse your steps really very well. You need to find a way to get secure enough to either put on boot cramp on, switch to downhill mode. And on a steep slope, that's awkward. You might drop your gear, you might slide out yourself, take a long ride and get really injured. Um, so you have to be a bit conservative with what you choose to tackle with ski crampons because as you commit, you know, until you find a flat spot, you kind of don't want to make a transition if you can avoid it. Um, so yeah, if you think eventually you're gonna have to transition to boot crampons, I urge you to do it early. 
seek out a flat spot tucked away from any kind of overhead hazard, a nice comfortable stance. And, you know, if you're desperate, there's ways to create something, you know, hack out something flat with your ice axe or shovel. Um, maybe anchor yourself into the snow somehow with your ax, but it, it can get hairy. So use these with a healthy dose of caution. Um, yeah, and so we already kind of hinted, you know, as things get steeper, um, more rugged, bumpier, boot crampons are really gonna be the way to go. Um, we've already talked a bit about different kinds of attachment methods uh, or mechanisms, I should say, but you basically have strap-on crampons that have, uh, like plastic cups on either end for normal soft boots. You can use a semi-auto on some split board specific soft boots and then fully automatic with the bales like you see at the bottom on hard boots or ski boots. Um, most of these are designed for mountaineering boots. So a soft boot for snowboarding is generally gonna be quite a bit wider than most mountaineering boots. So some brands make wide versions of their crampons and I would recommend that you check some of those out if you're in the market. Um, especially if you're ordering blind online. If you can go into the shop and just try them onto your boot, that's even better. You also wanna think about what they're made out of. So you have two options. You have steel crampons and you have aluminum crampons. So steel is gonna be more durable, uh, especially if you're gonna walk around on rocks and things. Um, there's not as much of a chance that you'll snap off one of your points and they won't grind down as quickly, um, but it's gonna be substantially heavier than aluminum too. Um, I think most of the time, aluminum crampons for ski mountaineering are the best choice. Um, if you're going to be doing any proper ice climbing or on rocks for long sections of time, steel, especially for the front points, can be advantageous. But if you're going to be walking for rocks on a long time, in most cases, you just want to take your crampons off. And if you have to put them on again later, that's fine. Um, so for the weight savings, I think those are great. Um, for soft boot crampons, Gravel makes a few nice wide options. And then for hard boots, I really like these uh, Petzl ones. Mine are called the Leopard, but there's one that's half steel called the Irvis too. And what kind of sets them apart is that instead of a bar in the middle, there's just this little string. So it makes it really compact and light. I can throw them in the bottom of my bag. And if I don't use them, I'm not even bummed that I carried them. I don't really notice they're there. Um, yeah, and just make sure when you're storing them, the points are together and they're in some kind of burly bag, a crampon bag, so they're not tearing up a water bladder or a nice puffy jacket inside your pack. Cool, and then we got ice axes. So these have a couple main purposes. Um, you're gonna use it as a climbing aid to make it easier to go up, or you can use it for self-arrest to stop an uncontrolled slide. And you know the techniques for that take some practice and some education. Um, before you go out using an ax, I would urge you to you know read some books and some online resources, maybe take a course or go out with a guide or at least get a friend you trust and is competent to kind of show you the ropes a little bit. Um, but these are important skills to you know do properly if you're going to do them at all. There's a lot of different kinds of axes out there, but much like uh, crampons and our tendency to often use aluminum ones in the winter time uh, and even the spring we can go light and aluminum with our axes too so there's two ratings for axes b rated is the lower of the two strength ratings and t rated is the higher b rated is fine and we usually like them to be pretty short so 45 to 50 centimeters is a pretty common range um, there's a couple here you see the camp course and nanotech and the petzl gully that are both great options um, a short ax is awesome because we're usually only using it in really steep terrain and it fits on or in your pack a lot more cleanly than a long like glacier trek and heart, uh, ice ax. Um, so, and it's obviously a bit lighter, right? So it's going to be the best tool for the job. You don't need super aggressive ice tools. You know, if you do, you already know what you're doing and who you are. Um, but we're not ice climbing and mixed climbing most of the time to get to our objectives. We just need a bit of extra security on firm snow or like the odd steep step here and there. Um, so you don't want a super curved tool and a really sharp aggressive pick. These less aggressive picks, especially like the one you see on the left there is actually better for self-arrest and only a gentle bend in the shaft is ideal for uh, performing self-arrest too. Um, so yeah, usually you just need one and uh, yeah, keep it light, keep it short, keep to some of these simpler designs if you already have one that you own and it's too long, 
it is possible to cut it down. Um, I have one here that I've chopped the end off of um, to make it a length I like. And you'll just notice that I kind of beveled this and filed away any sharp edges. I lost the spike, but in uh, you know only moderately firm snow or firm snow, just not you know bulletproof ice, it actually still works pretty well, I'd say. Um, so yeah, you might be able to avoid going out and buying something new. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, we have, there's more that you're going to want to carry in your pack realistically. On the Weston website, you'll see an education tab. Um, you know, this list isn't 100% complete either, but I'll touch on a few things we didn't really talk about. Um, you know, for example, sunglasses, sunscreen, a buff, a beanie, um, you know, some navigation tools. Um, don't consider what we've talked about today to be exhaustive. Um, but you can keep learning a bit more about this stuff on the Weston site. Um, so I know this has been a ton of information. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us and full like two hours into this thing. Um, but yeah, for those of you that have made it this long, I kind of want to open some of this up to questions from you guys. Um, for either myself or Izzy, Josh, Alex, any of us. Um, so maybe Alex, I'll let you run this section. Yeah. Um, if you want to do it through the chat or just open things up to people to speak, um, I'll let you take the reins here. But yeah, so, we're happy to answer some of your questions right here and now, or you can find us individually. We're pretty easy to find online if you want to reach out after the fact too. So you all have been also multitasking and crushing it and getting through a lot of the Q&A in the tab as well. So if anybody has anything that they feel uh, did that they want a little more info on, drop them in right now and I'll, I'll pull it out. But one question that I, I saw pop up in there that I think, you know, it's not necessarily gear related, but I think it's a good, good question of like for somebody who's really excited, they just bought their first split board and maybe are still trying to piece together the money to like buy all the beacon, you know, the beacon shovel probe and go get their airy one and everything. Where, where can they take their split board where they aren't going to be, you know, where, where they can avoid AVI danger, but still start to like go for tours and whatnot. What are some good, good first places to go while they're still building out the rest of their, you know, their avalanche safety kit? Yeah, I think it's, you know, whether you're new to split boarding or a split board is new to you, um, finding resorts that have uphill touring options are a great place to start. Uh, I know for me, it's like, if I have a new board or all this new equipment, I don't want to take it into consequential terrain for the first time. So I, I'll go tour it up just a local hill um, as long as they allow people to do that. Um, so that's mitigated terrain, right? The ski patrol is saying the mountain's safe. Um, usually it's early hours and before lifts open, they allow folks, uh, but that's a great place. Um, you can also, if you have a pass, ride your board, your split board at the resort get things dialed, um, figure out, you know, if you like your stance more narrow, more wide, given whatever bindings you're using. Um, sometimes I'll say cross, yeah, cross country ski trails generally are a safe place, uh, but be wary of roads and mountainous places. They're not always safe. You know, there can be avalanche terrain above a road. Red Mountain Pass would be a good example of a road that is kind of scary. Um, yeah, just looking for terrain to test it out on. Uh, I think local ski hills are a great place to start. Cool. Um, anything else? Any other additions from you all? Um, if not, one other question that kind of seemed to come up was that I think there's some split, split curious people on the uh, webinar. Um, so things like, Hey, do snowshoes work or what about approach, you know, those fold up approach skis or things like that. Um, what are your, you know, what are your takes on that as guides as far as, uh, as far as an access tool? Oh, you people, you see people start to use those and try them out because they might present as a cheaper option, but you very rarely see people continuing to use them beyond like, you know, half a season or one season, something like that. Um, so it's worth considering, you know, if you're going to invest in something that you end up having to move on from and invest again, you might not have actually saved yourself any money and just spent more. Um, yeah, carrying a separate snowboard on your back is cumbersome and quite heavy. Um, and even with approach skis, 
you know, that skinning performance will not be what you get out of a split board. Um, in my opinion, the performance difference between a real split board and either of those options is enormous and worth the cost. Um, but if you're truly pinched for money, you might be able to find some places um, that don't even require any special equipment and let you get out into the back country. So like out in Izzy's neck of the woods, out at Teton Pass, for example, uh, like boot packing up Mount Glory um, is a, an easy place to access the back country that doesn't require special gear. It still takes you to very real terrain and requires some competent decision-making, um, but there are some ways to get out there that don't require you to walk very far. Uh, and similar to side country access at a lot of resorts, um, you might be able to do it with standard downhill gear. So it can be an, a way to ease into things gear wise, but it is not a way to ease into things decision making wise. You, regardless, you're entering the backcountry and need to think about the terrain in the same sort of way. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much wrapped up. You all did such a great job answering, um, answering the questions. So I think that pretty much wraps up everything. Um, we had a video showcasing your neck of the woods as sort of a thank you everybody for, uh, for hanging out and all the thoughtful questions and discussions. So yeah, here's, here's a little video from Kapow Guides, who is our wonderful co-sponsor tonight and Adam is a guide with. So we'll end with, end with that. <laughs> snowboarding now <laughs> um well thank you everybody for spending the time to hang out with us um you know and, and listen to all this wonderful wisdom from these incredible guides uh thank you adam izzy and alex for uh your thoughtful tips tricks and advice um and yeah just to kind of wrap up um we will have a blog post going up probably about by next wednesday that covers all of these topics um you'll be able to really sink your teeth into the advice offered by these incredibly talented and knowledgeable guides um and that'll be at westinbackcountry.com and we'll obviously share it on social um and then i'll just kind of kick it up any last parting shot words of advice stoke for people as they embark on this upcoming season Adam, I know it's on the spot. <laughs> sure. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, I would just say, I know it's a lot of information to digest and the questions can be kind of endless. So as I've said, just don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I really don't mind answering questions kind of one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's about gear stuff, backcountry safety in general, um, you know, the skiing and split boarding around my neck of the woods up in British Columbia. Um, I'm more than happy to get back to you on an individual basis too. So I'm pretty easy to find online. All you got to know is my name, Adam Zock. Um, Instagram, Facebook seem to be the easiest way for this, um, you know, for me to be found in 2020. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. Or uh, if you can't get a hold of me, I'm sure if you drop West in the line, they'll get you in touch. So uh, yeah, just know I'm accessible and happy to help you out as you figure out a lot of this stuff for yourselves. Yeah, I echo Adam. If you have a shout, if you have any questions, uh, or if you want to come riding in the Tetons, and just remember that it's a lifelong pursuit. You know, it's easy to feel like you got to get into the biggest, most extreme terrain right away because that's what's in the movies. But there's nothing like a day of just riding fun, safe, powder with friends, and and just knowing that you're doing it right. So take it slow, do it right, and yeah, have fun. 
Yeah, I don't, I think that couldn't be any more true. I mean, don't be trying to rush into this kind of stuff. If it's new to you, you know, expect it to feel a little overwhelming and challenging at first. And even once you do a couple avalanche courses, it's not like all of a sudden the entire world of snow science and avalanche terrain, it's going to make sense to you. It really is a lifelong process. Um, and don't expect to be getting to the finish line ever, let alone in a winter or two from now. Um, yeah, e embrace the process of continuing to learn more about this stuff. Uh, it doesn't really end. Any parting shots, Jax? I was just gonna say the same exact thing. Um, it's a lifelong journey. Uh, you're, you're gonna get sucked in right away. So, you know, um, embrace it and go down the path and use people like us as resources. Reach out anytime, like they said. You'll enjoy it. Slay pow. Go forth and slay pow. Woo! Woo! All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>